You got to know what your facts are. Okay. You got to be able to defend your position, and you got to be make some sense. And then, if it makes some sense, if it benefit a group, then you can deal with it. Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Elevate Leadership Podcast, hosted by South Carolina State University's 1890 Research and Extension. I am Elizabeth Mosley Hawkins, Director of Marketing and Communications for SC State 1890. And if you can tell by the smile on my face, I am extremely excited about our guest today. But before I um, introduce our guest, whom you'll meet later. Let me tell you a little bit about 1890 Research and Extension. We are the public service arm for South Carolina State University. So we provide many of the outreach services, programs and activities to South Carolinians, um, as well as conduct uh, cutting edge research um, to help improve the quality of life for <coughs> South Carolinians, as well as raise the standard of living, much like our guest today who has been doing that for over 46 years um, and he is no stranger to SC State. He uh, actually has a building named after him in the 1890 Research and Extension Complex and he's also a Bulldog. Go Bulldogs! Um, I'm excited today to introduce you to none other than Senator John Matthews. Now, Senator Matthews, yeah. um, after 46 years, yeah. you announced that you will be retiring. Right. What led you to make that, I'm sure it was a very difficult decision, but what led you to make that decision? Well, I thought about it for about a couple of weeks. To be honest, about two years ago, I, I looked at it. I've been there 46 years. For me to commit again, it would have been 50 years, and I said to myself, mm. I'm not staying up here 50 years. <laughs> So at that point, I just made a hard decision. I think every once in a while, you got you got to make those changes, mm -hmm. allow new ideas, new blood to come in. I may take a different direction, may have mm -hmm. different thoughts, but the young man who's replacing me is also a bulldog. Awesome, yes. So he will be supportive of whatever your programs are, but he's a good guy. And so I made that decision, and um, 46 years, that's enough. That is amazing, yeah. and I'm pretty sure you have so many experiences. Um, tell me. Some I can tell you, some I can't. Okay. <laughs> well, tell us the ones you can tell us. Um, think about, you know, one of your most rewarding experiences over these 46 years. Well, when I started, when I first got elected, I focused on three things. I called it the three E's. I focused on education, economic development, and environment. Okay. Those have been the things that I tend to focus on. And uh, I, if you check my voting record, I'm always on the right side on education, economic development, and environment. I think they are key. If you're going to grow the economy, it's create opportunities, good education, mm -hmm. got to protect the environment, you got to have economic development. Yeah. So if you can put those three together, you've got a pretty good future. Hmm. So for those who don't know, yeah. Tell us how you got started in politics. How much time you got? <laughs> That's a long story. Um, I was always active, mm -hmm. not necessarily in politics per se. I was kind of behind the scene guy. I first got started, I was president of my youth NFCP chapter. Okay. The president of our chapter was a fellow by the name of QJ Smith, who was an ag graduate who graduated, but he was very vocal and he kind of took me on, my, on his wings. Mm -hmm. And we first started voter registration okay. across the county. Um, and, and really what drive and cement was the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm -hmm. When that incident happened, that really kind of launched our efforts across the county. Yeah. And then he came up with second member district plan for the house. Mm -hmm. I did not offer as a candidate. They, we created something called a screening committee, which I was on the screen, <laughs> screening committee, and I was the vice chair of the group, as the youth vice chair uh -huh. at the time. 46 years ago, I could say I was a youth, younger fellow. <laughs> anyway, they decided of all the candidates that offered, they didn't, they didn't think, she said no. So they came to my house one Saturday morning, uh -oh. I was over at my mother's house. <laughs> 
and say, look at me, you got to run. <laughs> and that's it. And that's history. Yeah. Wow. So what, what have you enjoyed most about your political career? I think the ability to get some things done. Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people that it's not what you say, it's what you do. Um, and I learned a lesson early on in politics that stayed with me. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people that people will forget what you say. They'll forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you treat them. Oh, so true. that part of the process of the, how you relate to your constituents and the community will carry you. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about, um, before you began, you, you were in education, yep. you were a small business owner, mm -hmm. and then you launched into politics. How, um, being an educator and a small business owner, how do, how do those skills translate it? How did you translate those skills as a politician? My father was a businessman and was growing up in a, in a small community. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted to go in business. I never wanted to go in politics. Oh. Business was my long-term goal. So after being in education for about 16 years, uh, the North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company, uh, which you may should know, mm -hmm. had, all, had started a lot of these little small cable companies in small communities. And they needed somebody to kind of manage their system. Mm -hmm. That was a school principal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, Basically, I, early in the morning, I would have to go and, to, we used to call it the head end. Okay. But back then, there were, there were no offices. If you had a problem in your cable system, you call into the, to the number mm -hmm. and uh, the tech. And so my job was basically to go there, take the information, make sure the techs get the job done. And when they decided to get, go out to the cable business, I decided to quit the principalship, and I'm going into cable <laughs> business. So I had um, I did that for about 15 years. Oh wow! And it was a it was a journey, but um, I, I think in the final analysis, mm -hmm. we finally sold it, and I retired. Wow! Mm -hmm. And so the the skills that you used as as a businessman, how did how did you translate them to the work that you did in in your political career? Well, I learned a great lesson in cable business because cable business is very technical. Uh, your head in your process and all the kind of stuff you had to work. So I learned that you you got to be the first one to open the door and the last one to close. Mm. <laughs> so every morning I would be there about 7.30 or 7 o'clock. Uh -huh. And um, normally I get home at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I did that for almost 15 years. Oh, wow. So a lot of energy, persistence. Mm -hmm. um, my father used to tell me, he said, son, if you can cultivate the will to succeed, regardless of what the situation will be, you will survive. Mm -hmm. If life knock you down, you get up. And if somebody closed the front door on you, go to the back door. Mm -hmm. If the back door is closed, go through the window. <laughs> so it's persistence, and I think that's how I survive. So, so I, I love that, um, mm -hmm. being persistent, because of course, as um, a, a leader, and especially in politics, you have to be mm -hmm. persistent, you know, to get your bills passed or, you know, to, to get your constituents' voices heard on the floor. Mm -hmm. But what other qualities would you say make a good leader? I, I think you got to have a, a vision for the community, a vision for the need of the people that you represent. You got to really understand what their needs are, mm -hmm. and when opportunities come, you try to fulfill those needs. Um, people will, will remember if you get something done for them. Mm -hmm. If you can get a town a grant, they remember. That. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's it's. I've always been the kind of represent, representative to try to do something for the communities I represent. I always wanted to be better off when I leave them than it was when I found them. Yeah. And so I focus on economic development. And because of, I was, had an education background, mm -hmm. hard knocks on running a cable company, <laughs> uh, you, you learn. And, and really, I didn't have any allies in cable business. Mm -hmm. There were no more other minority cable owners in this state. It was one in North Carolina or, or Maryland. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one in Virginia, but it was too far to communicate. Mm -hmm. So you had to 
figure it out, right? I said, buddy, this stopped with you. <laughs> so you had to hire some high staff. You had to hire somebody who had technical skills. You got to have had an engineer on board, mm -hmm. not full time, but come and help you when you run the big problems. And and we had we built our own system. Wow. From ground up. Well, so, we might we might need you to handle some of these cable hey, companies man. now. <laughs> Uh, when I went into cable business, it was what they call coaxial cable. Which yes. Was, it was a copper wire. Uh -huh. And then we transitioned from coaxial to fiber, mm -hmm. which is a whole new technology. Yeah. So in in that transition, I decided it was time to leave. <laughs> so we sold. So look, <clears throat> in the political landscape, um, a lot of times we, we see politicians fall from grace. Crazy love. <laughs> because they might have made, you know, some some sort of error. You know, how how have you avoided? Well the first lesson grace? I said to myself, <laughs> most people get in trouble because of money. Mm. I said, I'm not messing with other people's money. If I don't earn it, it ain't mine. Give the Caesar what's to do to Caesar. Mm -hmm. So if I, it's not mine, I don't so I, I sooner or later you'll develop a reputation. So people don't come to you with foolishness. Yeah. So if you, and and most politicians who get in trouble, got, it was economics. Um, I've seen people who got elected didn't have an independent income, mm. and they get in trouble. Gotcha. You, if you're going to be in public office, you need to have an independent income of of the elected office, because really you don't make nothing in the general assembly. Mm -hmm. Do you know what my salary was? <laughs> no way. When I first got elected, my salary was seven thousand dollars. You can live off of that. It never got over ten thousand five hundred. When I quit, oh man, my basic salary was ten thousand five hundred dollars. So you, it really get, has to you, be a passion. No, you do get a little in district expense. Okay. You get something for travel, but it, it you can't live off that salary. Okay. You have to have an independent revenue stream mm -hmm. that's independent. Gotcha. Then you can be independent. Mm. So you have to to avoid those pitfalls. I guess you know, just make sure that you rely on your sense of in integrity. Yeah, you, you, your e <clears throat> your economy has to be yours and not theirs, mm -hmm. and and don't depend on the general assembly or people, different lobbyists to help you out. You, you get in trouble. Yeah, um, when you talk about failures. Um, a lot of times, people, of course, are afraid to make mistakes, but they Everybody could be your mistakes, yeah, yeah. But they could be your greatest teacher. So, what what mistake have you made, and um, what have you learned from that mistake? That's a good question. I never <laughs> thought about. It. If you're talking about mis made a mistake in politics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, politics in, in the general assembly require quick reactions. A lot of times votes come up, you may have 30 seconds mm -hmm. to decide what you're going to do. Yeah. Um, so you got to be able to, to rationalize. I go into in, in the General Assembly, here's, my, here's what I did. In every bill, there are winners and losers. Mm -hmm. What I figure out real early on, does my district win on this or they lose? <laughs> if they yeah. lose, I'm against it. If they win, I'm for it. Mm -hmm. And if there's nothing, if there's no winners or losers, then it's a policy question. But most legislative activities of bills are, are based on winners and losers. Mm -hmm. So I obviously look at it. I give you a perfect example. We, when we pass some some tax cuts, mm -hmm. uh, the first one I look at the per capita income in, in the district I represent was not sufficient. All the tax cuts were going to, if, if you go to the Department of Revenue, they won't tell you the names of the people who were the winners, but they'd give you the address. <laughs> the money was going to Buford, hmm. going to Greenville, mm -hmm. going to Spartanburg, Hilton Head. I All said, no way, areas, yeah. I'm a loser here. I'm against <laughs> that. So um, oftentimes in, in politics, there are political differences. Yeah. that can um, hinder, you know, you getting a bill passed. Um, how did you work through that? 
Well, you got to be persistent. You got to know what your facts are. Okay. You got to be able to defend your position, and you got to be make some sense. And then, if it makes some sense, if it benefit a group, then you can deal with it. Um, I think over a period of time, you develop relationships. You know people in the General Assembly who's going to come up with some radical, crazy ideas. <laughs> you, then you know some people who tend to be... I've always believed that if, if reasonable people can solve any problem or get along, if they're reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I try to be a reasonable... I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to hear you, listen to your side, you listen to mine. And take the facts and then make a decision. Yeah. You talked about, um, I'm glad you, you brought up um, relationships mm -hmm. because I know <laughs> mm -hmm. having to um, do the work that you've done for yeah. so long, you've, you've had to have a good rapport with um, not just your constituents, but your, your colleagues. Um, for, for people who are um, in leadership roles or aspiring to be, to be leaders, how important is it to have um, relationships? Relationships are critical because of the relationships kind of position you with your community. Mm -hmm. It also with constituency outside of your community, uh, with lobbyists. Mm -hmm. They kind of know where you stand. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't need to go down with that issue. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to work. Uh, so you, you kind of carve out a niche of okay. who you are what what your values are going to be, mm -hmm. and um, okay. sooner or later, everybody get pigeonholed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I call it, that's kind of an acronym, but anyway, yeah. everybody in the General Assembly, the lobbyists can kind of tell you who it is, what he stands for, whether we can get him to do something, or whether he's not going to do it. Yeah. And sooner or later, you can get that reputation. You know? People leave you alone. <laughs> leave you alone. We don't want. Yeah, <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when, as leaders or as a leader, mm -hmm. um, you can't do it alone, right? No. You have to have a team. And so, um, just like in corporate, you know, you as a politician um, had a team of advisors and. How, how did you work with them to make sure that they helped to carry out your vision? Well, in, in the General Assembly, in order to get something passed and get something done, you've got to develop relationships. You've got to know um, where the issues are. Mm -hmm. You've got to know where, uh, where the decisions are being made. And in the General Assembly, most decisions are made at the, what they call the um, subcommittee level. So if you want something done, you got to develop a relationship on the subcommittee. You got to figure out who's on the subcommittee. Uh, then you got to start talking to them, mm -hmm. and then you develop allies who may be thinking similar like you. Okay. So you build teamwork. And if you got a, a real controversial bill, it usually take about three years to, to get it done. Mm -hmm. The first time you introduce it. Mm -hmm. You really don't expect it to pass, mm -hmm. but you want to find out who's opposed and why they oppose it. You want to hear their side. Gotcha. Then you make adjustments, <laughs> and, and, and so if you get some people to vote with you, you talk to them, find mm -hmm. out what their views are, and you talk to this different people, individuals, find out why they oppose it. Wow. So okay. you make adjustments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you reintroduce it. Let me get a little personal with you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Um, we at the top of uh, the show, you kind of talked about um, how you got into politics. Yeah. Who who do you admire in the political space? Who do I admire in the political yeah. space? <laughs> I, I think if if you look back, if I'm say who mm -hmm. got me started, helped me on the way. Yeah. It's probably Q. J. Smith. You, okay. You don't know it. He graduated from here, but he was an ag major. Okay. Um, I think I became close friends with a couple of people. Mm -hmm. 
One of them named Ken McKinley Washington, you probably don't know. No, him. sir. Kay Patterson was my seat mate for about I 30. remember him. I think Kay was kind of a very, well, you know Kay Patterson. <laughs> we were seat mates about 20, 26 years. Okay. Um, I know what his views were. Mm -hmm. Kay was much more, he fight, was a fireball kind of guy. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to try to calm him down. <laughs> <laughs> And we used to play what we call good cop, bad cop. Okay. Kid get up and raise some hell. <laughs> then I go try and talk to folks, kind of work it out. He'll be up there debating. And then I say, okay, you got it. <laughs> you sit down. You all were a team. <laughs> yeah. So you got to know how to, so you got to work the system. Yeah. Yeah. And if you get in, in the system for a while, you know where most people's heads are. Mm -hmm. And who can, who will probably be with you, who will probably be against you. Yeah. So I'm um, thinking about um, 46 years, mm -hmm. and I think you started 74, 75? 74. 74. And, and, uh, well, I started working at it in 64. Okay, <laughs> 64. Yeah. What, what, um, what progress have you seen uh, in South Carolina since beginning? If you look at the big picture, Counties are rated as in full classification. Okay. Least developed, moderate developed, advanced, then the fourth is, is the top. When I got elected, this county was at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It was ranked as the number four in least developed. And it's basically tied to two things that measure a county not individual, just as a county as a whole. Mm -hmm. One of them is per capita income. That's the mm -hmm. number one issue. Second one, number, number of people that has a high school diploma, mm -hmm. number of have a college degree. You look at economic capacity. Then, since I've been there, this county has leaped for 13 counties. Mm. Has moving from number four, four. all the way up. So progress is measuring the big picture, not necessarily individual. Okay. Now individual, you might be worse off. <laughs> but as a county, we're better off. Okay. We're not where we are, ought to be, but we're in a much better position to get where we need to be. And part of that is because of a couple of things. Okay. I don't know how much time I got, but. You're fine. Um, what's growing our economy? The number one issue that's growing our economy in this in this state mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. is the Port of Charleston. Mm. And let me tell you why that's important. We can bring in a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Most of what we bring in comes in on the Pacific Rim countries. So if you're bringing product in from the Pacific Rim, it comes to California. Two thirds of the U.S. population live east of the Mississippi. It's the largest concentration of wealth in the world. Now, you might not have no money, but you're living in the wealthiest <laughs> ground <laughs> in the world. Okay. That's where people want to get to. That's the, that's the market. What's, what, what makes that different is that we're bringing those products in mm -hmm. and we bring them into the ports. Here's, here's what really drives it. Those ships that bring container ships, if you go down to Charleston today and look at those container ships that's coming into Charleston, they have about 7,000 to 7,500 containers. About 15 years ago, they start dredging the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. Now they got these new mega ships. Yep. Those mega ships uh, need at least 50 feet of deep water. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at all the ports on the East Coast, and remember that's, that's where the market is. There are only about five ports on the East Coast that can handle those new mega ships because they got to have 50 feet of deep water. Mm -hmm. That's why we dredge, dredge in the harbor in Charleston to get it below 50 feet. All the other ports are basically river ports. And in 10th grade biology, remember, <laughs> a science chemistry one, Salt water has a heavier density and carry a heavier load than fresh water. Mm -hmm. Savannah is our number one competitor. Savannah is a 
freshwater pulp okay. come in the next five to ten years, you're probably going to have about four or five ports on the East Coast. Those ports who are on the salt water. Okay. You've got one in New York, Virginia, one in Maryland, Charleston, and then you got Savannah. Not mm -hmm. Savannah, um, in Florida, Florida, Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. But Jacksonville is too far out of the, out of the market. What what's going to drive our economy is the three fastest growing areas in the southeast is Jacksonville, mm -hmm. Atlanta, and Charlotte. If you were to draw a circle around those three, we're right near. Orangeburg County is yeah. the center of the donut. So in the long run, if you're looking for for marketing to get your product to market and a place to do it, you always want to be close to the center. Hmm. So, and the second thing that helps us is that we got I-95 mm -hmm. served the north and south market. Yes. 26 served east, east and, and west. west. Yes. We got two railroads mm -hmm. uh, that serve different markets. So we can serve different markets. Um, and let's give you an example. When I was in college, if you go down the railroad corner and watch that little train run out, to the railroad corner, mm -hmm. it was a single car with less than a quarter mile of, 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 of cars. cars. Mm -hmm. If you would go that today, it has three cars pulling it, double lane, double stack. Mm -hmm. Because a railroad company has to be what we call a primary. Mm -hmm. You've got two kinds of railroads. And I'm not going to, two kinds of railroads. Okay. you got a secondary in a primary. Norfolk Southern, which runs through the city, is a primary railroad. Okay. And a primary railroad is determined by, you got to have at least 500 miles of track. Norfolk Southern starts in Atlanta, comes up to Spartanburg, Greenville, Charlotte, down to Charleston. Charleston has been designated as their shipping point. BMW ships about 70% of their cars overseas. Mm -hmm. Volvo, which is this building, the, the, this district, Johnson. yeah, yeah. It's in, but it's in the senatorial district, same mm -hmm. district. Uh, they're shipping about 65% of their cars back overseas. Mm -hmm. So that makes, uh, that puts us in a good uh -huh. key position well, for long-term growth. What, what's your hope for South Carolina? I, I've, I've always believed if, if you can give people a good quality job, quality income, they'll solve most of their problems. Mm. So if you can grow the economy, we can do that. I think the biggest problem I've seen in the African American community mm -hmm. is that our skill sets are not matching up with the 20 cents job market. And the advent of technology are putting African American community in a deeper hole. Mm. Technology is changing so fast. Yes. Uh, so, and if you don't have the ability today to work from home, you're in trouble. Yes. So, we already see that too with, yeah. with a lot of the schools yeah. and the students who jobs don't have now, access to broadband. And, and a lot of the jobs are not going back to the building. They're going to stay home. Yeah, very true. So you got to have, so I think the big picture for me and how do we resolve that? There's been a group of us who've been pushing not free college but free tech. <laughs> <laughs> because the try to, if, if you were in the first bill we passed about five years ago said if you live in one of these underdeveloped counties, you go to tech free. What we're trying to do is increase the skill sets. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, a lot of the kids have not taken advantage of that because you can go to tech and take a two-year degree. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go in majoring in the college career and get two years out of it and transfer. And then come to SC State. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> So, um, Senator Matthews, after 46 years of serving in the General Assembly, you were the longest serving um, African American and uh, assistant minority leader. Tell me, what do you hope your legacy is? We're not where we want to be, but when you look at any statistical measurement, they're better off. Mm. Well, Senator Matthews, mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate you coming here and taking time out. 
I appreciate that and, and talking to us and um, I, I thank you for doing you know the work that you've done um, for the county and um, I know you're not done. <laughs> well, I think I am. <laughs> no, <laughs> you still have more in you that you, that you can give us. Um, and no. so I thank you so much well, for, for joining us. It's good to be with you. <laughs> um, I think this institution has a bright future and I'm gonna tell you why. Okay. I've been, uh, we've been arguing with, with, with the Chamber of Commerce and Business that this state is not gonna make it mm. until they improve the skill set and the quality of life for African American community. Mm -hmm. The population's too big. If you don't, um, if you don't help, this goes back to a principle of mine. I'm okay. To, I always believe that in life, if my neighbor's better off, I'm better off. Absolutely. If my neighbor's worse off, I'm worse off. Mm -hmm. So it behooved me to try to create community where people are better off, because that make all of us better off. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to sell that message to the opposite Republican legislators. Man, you can't fix this system unless you help all of us. Yes. The minority population is too big and too far behind. And I don't think they have the, the, the wherewithal to do it by themselves. They need some infusion. Mm -hmm. And so policies that affect people's quality of life, you got to put some sensitivity in it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the education, that's why we push free tech. Free tech yeah. Eventually, we're probably going to have free college. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the first step. And when we did it for those 14 counties mm -hmm. of high poverty, which include one of this, this county, mm -hmm. include Bamberg County, mm -hmm. but three years ago, <coughs> state chairman come back to us and say, this is a good idea, let's make it <laughs> statewide. So that means now any kid statewide can benefit from that. No. So I think you gotta do things like that that can make a difference in people's life. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly thank you for making a difference in the the lives of Orangeburg oh, and District 39. Thank you so much. I'm going to say this, no quick. quit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people the three things I think change my projection in, trajectory okay. in life. And the first one is, I thought the first decision I made was to go to college. Mm -hmm. I thought that made a difference. Absolutely. Second one, I decided to go. Married my wife. Okay. Uh, Geraldine Hay, which is a graduate of this, and she's deceased yes, now. Yes, yes. And, th and the second one, is to run for public office. Mm. I think in life you got to figure out where you want to go, how you want to get there, but you got to create the foundation. Mm. Education is the fundamental to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. And finally, just have the will to succeed. Yes. You, you get there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, okay. Senator Matthews. We, we definitely appreciate you. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining us. Again, you are watching Elevate Leadership Podcast, hosted by South Carolina State University's 1890 Research and Extension.